Hello, and thanks for joining us for episode one of Hot Topics with Hot Rod. Buffed, wow, look at that tank. I'm Erin Hollihan Haskell, president of HeatingHelp.com, and it is our pleasure to partner with Kalefi on this webinar series. I'm delighted to introduce my friend, Hot Rod Roar, tuning in from his workshop on Know-It-All Lane. Hot Rod travels from sea to shining sea for Kalefi North America, sharing his 30 plus years of experience as a plumbing, radiant heat, and renewable energy contractor. A regular contributor for industry magazines, Hot Rod puts his rubber to the road experiences to pen. He was also recently recognized with the Carlson Hollihan Industry Award of Excellence. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us tonight, Hot Rod. Well, thank you for uh, helping us put this together, and uh, we appreciate working with Heating Help. And uh, now that you're captain of the ship, you're doing a great job there, so keep it up. Oh, thank you. I will awesome. turn the mic over. All right, thanks. And I want to thank uh, my staff. There's a lot of back-end work that goes into putting one of these on as far as getting the graphics together and getting the invites and stuff out. So Mary Olson helps with that, and Sharon and uh, Katie at our company. And then Dan Perkins is going to help me tonight um, answering questions. So we want to keep this informal as possible. So if you have a question and you want to um, talk to us, uh, raise your hand, and Mary's going to watch for people raising their hands and trying to open the mic. So if you want to talk back and forth, we can do that. Or if you want to just type in a question, uh, on the uh, question bar, Dan's gonna watch for those. He'll answer some of them if he can. If not, um, I tell him by all means interrupt me. So it slows me down a little bit. I get rolling sometimes and uh, uh, I get start talking too fast. So I tell Dan just to interrupt me if there's a question that pertains to the slide around or something like that, for example. So um, yeah, so this is the topic. I really like this topic. I've been playing around with buffer tanks. In fact, I didn't learn, uh, didn't realize how long it's been until I started putting this together. I found some slides that I had taken with my old Sony Mavica, what are those floppy disk cameras? So they've got to be almost, what, 20 years old now. So there's some pretty uh, oldies but goodies in here. But uh, anyways, a couple housekeeping slides first. Yeah, this is just some um, tech support stuff from uh, GoToWebinar people. If you break down or something like that and you have trouble getting in or if the, if the connection's bad, sometimes if you just log out and the, uh, whoops, a wasp log back in, you'll get a better connection because it goes through different switches across the country. So sometimes if the if it looks herky-jerky or something too, you can log out and log back in. Uh, we will archive this. It'll be on our the Cleffy YouTube channel as well as the, um, Aaron's going to put it on the Heating Help uh, YouTube channel. So if somebody else wants to uh, watch it later, if you want to review it or something like that, uh, it's it'll be available. It'll take a week or so for us to get that out. And then also the uh, PDFs of the slides, if you want them, I'm willing to share those. So at the end, I think there's a little survey comes across. And if you want any of that stuff, um, just let us know and we'll, we'll email it to you. Uh, so tonight, first episode, this is, uh, we're going to do four of them uh, with Heating Help as our partner here. And we talked about the buffer tanks first. And then we're going to do um, number two, mix it up. That's going to be on mixing valves, different type of mixing valves, how to use them, how to apply them, how to troubleshoot them, how to repair them. Uh, pressure's on. We'll talk about pressure reducing valves and pressure in um, uh, boiler systems and maybe even uh, plumbing systems for that matter. We'll talk about pressure reducing valves. And then, yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do on episode four. We want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, Legionelle and stuff like that. I know that's a hot topic and everybody's talking about it now, but maybe I've got a little different spin on it or different uh, thoughts on that. So that's uh, something we'll do for the last one on number four. All right, and this is, yeah, so uh, the comp our company, as most of you probably know, is uh, in Italy, and we're proud that the owner of our company, Marco Cleffi, has been generous in supporting uh, some of the efforts over there to fight the COVID, and it's, it looks like Italy's on the downside of it now, which is uh, good. Our factory's back up to 100%. People can move around and stuff, but uh, uh, we're pleased and proud that uh, Marco was generous in uh, helping out the local hospitals that needed money and equipment to, to battle that virus, so... And along those lines, and Eric can help me out with this a little bit, we chose two charities tonight that we're going to donate to. So we're going to match donations, both uh, Heating Help, Aaron, as well as Cleffy, up to $500. So if you folks want to uh, join and donate to one of these. John Hopkins we chose because they are working uh, around the clock, I'm sure, on a, on a... Uh, uh, for, on the virus coming up with a you know a solution for that and the vaccine or something so we thought maybe that's a good place to uh, to send some money and help them out anything that I'm missing there you want to add Aaron on that no I think you have it covered they're doing some great work and we love to support them this evening yeah and so for the next four episodes we're going to choose a different charity every time that uh, you can donate and uh, 
and we'll match that donation. So and go get the dogs. All right, so we got two trivia questions. We'll do the first one, and it's for a, a T-shirt. We're going to do some Hot Topic T-shirts that look like the uh, uh, the logo that you saw on the first slide there. So how would you say, let's go in Italian? Just type it in there, and Mary's going to watch that, and in a minute or two here, she'll, she'll come up with a winner. Thought we'd put a little Italian spin on it tonight, a little Hawaiian Italian spin with the shirt there. So all right, so let's get down to the nuts and bolts here. I want to talk about uh, buffer tanks and uh, – um, how you select them, why you select them, uh, how you uh, pipe them and stuff like that, different controls we can use. And, you know, I haven't found any really uh, rules out there when you need to use a buffer, when it's a good idea. I mean, you just got to kind of look at what the goal is. And it's the goals can be different depending on the application. I know uh, my uh, start with buffer tanks was when I was playing around with wood-fired boilers. And we're just trying to extend the run time. By the time you get those things fired up and going and stuff, you just want to run a, a long, hot cycle. Well, if there's not much of a load, it was kind of an awkward thing to do. So that's, I think, working with John way back, back in the 90s, probably. We started playing around with different buffer tank options. And now what it kind of morphed into more so now is people with um, a low mass boiler, low water content boiler. And, and you get a call and says, gosh, I hear my boiler all night, just on, off, on, off, every 20, 30 seconds or every minute, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, it's a modulating boiler. It's all the way down to turn down. It's lowest turn down. I still have issues with it. So what can I do? So that's where a buffer tank can play uh, into the equation. And another place that it's a big player is with the um, um, chillers with cool water, you know, uh, heat pumps. In fact, most of the heat pump manufacturers will have some kind of oh, uh, recommendations or rules of thumbs on how many gallons per ton, perhaps, or how many gallons based on the BTU output of the uh, chiller. Because a lot of these chillers and heat pumps don't have variable speed like we do in the ModCon boilers, and some of them maybe have two-speed uh, compressors. So they can bang on an awful lot if they don't have a consistent load. So that's really a, a good application. So we'll look at all those, and we'll look at them. Um, live demo at the end that I put together. So what I'm doing differently on this um, series as opposed to Coffee with Cleffy that we do is I want to make it uh, informal. So again, we want to encourage people to participate, but I wanted to do something a little different than everybody's doing on webinars and that I would bring it in the shop and I would build things that pertain to the topic and uh, you know try and film it. Hopefully it's a good quality video that you can see. So you know what it is for me is I see drawings all the time and I see sketches on paper and in the different magazines and it shows like a a tank with blue and red lines. And I said, well, is that really what happens in real life that it's gonna be blue cold water on the bottom and hot at the top? How do I know if that's right? So I said, you know, I'm gonna try and uh, demo some of those. And in addition to just demoing the temperature, I wanted to make a, a lot of clear demos so you can actually look in there and see what's going on. And I shoot some colored dye in there so you can see how the flows are going around. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, the moral of the story tonight is to look inside a buffer tank and see what goes. So we'll go through the slides. We'll talk about it and then we'll we got a little I don't know about three minute video that we'll show towards the end then and then we'll come back and talk about it so the other thing is you know if you've noticed uh, cast iron boilers are shrinking also it used to be back in the day when I started in the business you know a hundred fifty thousand b2 boiler might weigh 300 pounds it might hold 8 10 12 gallons of water there's cast iron boilers out there now that weigh 120 pounds and hold about three gallons of water and they're 120,000 B2 output. So we're starting to lose the ability of the boiler to be a buffer like it used to back in the day. And with a lot of low mass uh, heating systems, uh, maybe panel radiators or something like that, we don't have the buffer, buffer ends, if that's even a word, in the uh, distribution anymore. We've got low um, mass heat emitters, we've got low mass boilers. So that's where the modulation can help out quite a bit, but until we get to the point where, in my opinion, we can modulate, say, from 1,000 BTU up to maybe 50,000 BTU, have that wide of a turn down, there's still going to be the potential to have um, some cycling or excessive cycling. And the other thing is, if we're looking for a place to store energy, water is a really good place to store energy. You know, next to the, the fuel itself, the natural gas in the pipeline, probably the best place to store it, but once we uh, combust that fuel and we turn it into a thermal energy either we've got to use it as fast as we're making it to be most efficient or store it somewhere and it just so happens that uh, water as you can see here on my bottom talking point is about 16 percent more efficient of uh, storing the energy in water than it is even in the cast iron mass of the uh, the old boilers that we had and that would be the same of course for the piping or the radiators uh, the water itself is the better place so with that in mind if we had a well-insulated uh, vessel, tank, or whatever it might be, that's a great place to park those uh, BTUs until we can use them um, 
as efficiently as possible. So yeah, we talked about these, get rid of the bang, bang, the frequent on, and I don't know what the definition is uh, too much uh, cycling. Somebody says every time a boiler fires, it should run for maybe uh, 10 minutes before it shuts off and uh, waits to its next call. I don't know if that's an official thing, but that seems to be, a, I've heard anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes every time a boiler fires up, it would be nice to have that boiler run um, just to be able to get up to a uh, you know, efficient running conditions. When it starts up cold, a cast iron boiler especially, um, it's not running very efficiently until things start warming up, the flue temperature comes up and stuff. So yeah, mod cons, I mean, it's getting better all the time. I think when the first mod cons came out, we were looking at what, maybe five to one turn downs and then some seven to ones, and now we've got some 10 to ones. And those are great steps in the right direction, but uh, you know, we still would like to get down this low number. This is my goal in my lifetime in the industry. I'd like to see a boiler that could almost go down to like a match size flame of what's that, maybe 400 BTUs per hour and then modulate up to maybe, you know, 50 or 60,000. The other thing on residents is that the heat load is shrinking. As you notice, as people are building more efficient homes, better insulation, better windows, people are more, uh, I think, in tune to uh, energy costs. So as the buildings get more efficient, of course, those loads come down too. And the other thing that I'm trying to show on these slides, let's see if I can remember all my talking points here, is the weather is changing, whether you're on that bandwagon or not, it is. And the fact of the matter is the people that keep track of that, um, they're even changing their maps. So I don't know if you can look at these maps and see how they're actually moving these color zones. They're starting to shift these up. They're starting to uh, spread them out a little bit here. And this one here, look at New York, where they've changed the temperature zone in New York State, uh, even up here in the upper uh, extreme cold areas of the, of the country, they're starting to move these lines up. So that means those loads are going away. So if you size the boiler for loads in a building in this, you know, one of these zones up here uh, 10 years ago, and now these days of um, extreme cold weather, design temperatures are getting less and less each year, you're oversized again. So that's where the buffer can kind of uh, absorb some of that condition. Uh, in my research here, looking at all these maps, they say, in fact, I think it's on the next slide here. They say, if you want the best information, it really comes from these folks here. Uh, just because these happen to be where people that grow things go, and so they want the best data. And the USDA uses the tightest data to come up with these maps. You can see it varies a little bit from the, the NOAA map, which are both government entities, but um, the way they sample their data and they use uh, what they call um, <clears throat> uh, real life data when they use the USDA maps to show this information. So they try and get it as accurate and close as possible for people that are maybe growing tomatoes or something like that, where this is a really important. Uh, information that when they can start planting that. So this information's out there for free these days if you want to see the weather data. So what we did, and we, as in John Siegenthaler, when we did our last uh, two hydronics issues ago, we talked about how you can lower the temperature in existing hydronic systems. And so we said, well, let's just use the best data we can find and show what a real life application is for degree days at a, at a site. So Siggy being in upstate New York there, I think he pulled this off either Syracuse or Utica. I think this is done in both. This one's Syracuse. And if you look here, let's say they designed for, I don't know, is it minus five? Maybe some of you guys in that area know what you designed there, design day. Maybe zero to minus five is a design condition up there. This shows you the percentage in hours in a year that you're at that actual condition. If you look over here, the majority of the year in Syracuse, New York, according to the most current weather data, and this, by the way, goes back 30 years of compilation to come up with these bin, it's called bin data because a bin is a certain size of information and you can choose your bin size when you put these graphs together. So you can see here, we used a five degree uh, bin to come up with this. So it, it made it pretty accurate and it makes a pretty good graphic to show you that, you know, if you size the boiler and certainly if it was a single speed boiler for this condition right here, zero to minus five, that boiler is grossly oversized, what, 90% of the year there. So that's going to be an issue for a short cycling. And if or when uh, the climate starts getting warmer and warmer, this condition will change even more, as you can see on the maps on the previous slide. So with that in mind, and let's look at the graphic another way over here. If we chose our design load and we knew what temperature we needed to maintain this design load, obviously anything below a design condition, which would be anything this yellow um, curve or arch right here, uh, we would need obviously less BTUs to put in there. So you can look at this data a couple different ways. You could build this for your own location. I'm sure if you're in the, um, like I am in Missouri, this wouldn't be obviously as low down here because we designed for above, uh, about 10 degrees above. So uh, it would shift the 
you know, the whole thing would slide a little bit. But but my, the goal here is to just show you that your boiler isn't at design conditions as much as you might think it is. So when you design for that, um, just know that all these other hours or days or however you want to look at that bin data, uh, your boiler's oversize. Yeah, the modulating boiler is going to take up for quite a bit of this. I mean, they're not going to get you from this condition to this condition because you just don't have that much turn down yet. So there might still be an application where buffer could be a value um, with a modcom boiler, especially if you got micro loads. You know, some people like to zone, gosh, maybe even a tall radiator in the bathroom or something, a tiny little load, excuse me. Let's say that's a... 1500 BTU per hour load, and you got a boiler that's turned down to even 8000 BTU on its lowest turndown. Well, obviously, you still got the, uh, the potential to short cycle that. So, yeah, I mean, you can use this data. Uh, Hydronic 17 um, and also 24, I believe, we show you how to crunch these numbers, how to use this data, how you can go on different websites. ASHRAE's got this data. You can find this in a lot of different places. It's just uh, common weather bin data, is what they call it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, how we would use a buffer tank and what happens inside a buffer tank. And so this is an example of two different conditions, two different tank drawings here, and both of these tanks contain exactly the same amount of energy, but one of the tanks has more useful energy, and a term that they use for that is exergy. That's kind of a different definitions for that, but it's kind of a definition of amount of useful energy. And so the way we'd explain this is, so let's say this tank has been... Um, heated up to 110 degrees and it's not stratified as you can see here it's 110 bottom middle at the top and that would probably indicate that there's a pump on here that's running all the time I've got a little circulator that doesn't toggle off when the tank gets up to temperature maybe from a wood board or whatever it might be so my tank is always blended and the highest temperature I can get that tank is whatever the aquastat I should have put one in here let's say mid-range on here I've got an aquastat at 110 degrees when that tank gets up to 110 degrees it shuts off pump keeps running my tank is mixed I'd rather stratify, you've probably heard that name uh, used for uh, weather stratifies, you know, when hot air goes up in a forced air building, that's an example of stratification. Well, the same thing happens inside a tank. And so if I were to shut this tank off at, let's say, midpoint here with an aquastat, it's going to stratify if I don't have a circulator that's churning up or stirring up this tank. And so now what will happen is I could stack, well, you could pick a number here, depending on where that burner went off. If this boiler was running at 140 degrees when the burner finally kicked off, that tank could essentially stack to 140 degrees. Well, now I've got the same amount of energy, but what I can do with this tank that I can't do with this tank is I can contribute energy to a load that's 115 degrees. So for an example, let's say my panel radiator shut off and a couple minutes later it has to kick back on and it's still sitting there at 115 degrees. This tank can, can still contribute energy to that load where this tank can't because it's sitting there at 110 degrees. So just by allowing this tank to stratify and stack like that, I can get more useful, I can pull more useful energy out of it. Same amount of energy went into there, same amount of BTUs to get this tank up to temperature in both these examples but this is gonna be more useful. So my goal should be um, to stratify my tank. When I'm using the tank for buffering, I wanna stratify it. A couple ways to do that, a tall tank stratifies better than a uh, stubby tank or even a horizontal tank. Sometimes I've seen people use a, a horizontal buffer tank, but there's not a lot of ability you know, across the width of that tank to stack this temperature like that. So a tall skinny tank is really ideal because it really shoots that stratification up in a skinny tank and also the taller the tank, the more I have for this. This is called a thermocline. What we're looking at here where the color changes from the top to bottom, that's what's known as a thermocline. And that thermocline would move like it did over here. That thermocline moved from all the way from the top to the bottom. Unfortunately, it's not the best um, temperature if you'd be able to use that. And there's, if you're a numbers cruncher and you're into the math, there's the formula that you can uh, do that calculation and determine, again, how much useful energy is in there. Bob, can I uh, interrupt you for a very important question? This oh. is Mary. Uh, your trivia question, how do you say let's go in Italian? Would that happen to be andiamo? <laughs> That's all right. And well, we, we have a winner from the great Midwest, Bill Chanel. So he is going to be receiving a very cool Hot Topics t-shirt. So thanks for everybody who participated. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. And now Thank back you. to the important stuff. <laughs> thanks, Mary. You bet. Uh, so here's another thing. So if you were to build a tank that you want to use for a buffer tank, you'd want to avoid anything that's going to churn up and break up this stratification or break up this thermocline. So uh, you wouldn't want to come straight in the top or straight in the bottom. Uh, if you did, maybe put a little diffuser plate in there. 
I like to see put people come and go from a buffer tank out the side like that because you don't have as much uh, maybe potential to break up that stratification. I'll show you what I did on the buffer here in my shop. I actually put a tube all the way in the side and I cut slots in it on the top for the top one and on the bottom for the bottom one, trying to keep those two layers separated like that. So um, you can buy dip tubes that do that. Uh, I've seen dip tubes that go in the side of a tank and they've got like a curl up on them. Uh, two things that would keep from uh, breaking up that stratification. But if you had a dip tube came in the side and goes up to the top, you're going to get to all that usable energy that's hiding at the very dome top of a tank and at the dome bottom of it. Uh, so there's a couple ways that you can uh, maximize your tank um, capacity by just the way you pipe into it and pipe out of it. And I've got some other examples of that coming up. So by far the most common buffer tank that I see out there when I see manufacturer suggestions and I just come back from uh, Oklahoma of all places and uh, talking to some geo people out there that use a lot of buffer tanks on their uh, geo systems and this is the most common way that they buffer them is they use what's called a four port tank. And so basically it's uh, you come in the one side from your either your chiller, your boiler, whatever it might be that you're buffering, and then you go out the other side and then you take your load off the opposite side, the top and lower connections. Now this is nice in that uh, it's a giant hydraulic separator. So if you had a huge pump over here, maybe pumping through your loop field or something like that, and you had small uh, zone pumps over here and you don't want those two pumps to bang against each other and fight, you've got a hydraulic separator here just in the, the size of this chamber, the size of this tank. So Gives you good separation that way. It's a great place to do air removal. In fact, of all the things I'll show you on the demo when it comes up, is this surprised me the most about how a buffer tank works is how well that little float air vent at the top of a tank really does a great job of air removal under a lot of different conditions, even extreme conditions. So fairly easy to find now these buffer tanks. A lot of the manufacturers, in fact, most of the tank manufacturers either have or will make a tank like this for you from whatever side you need. There's Boiler Buddy has off the shelf ones, I think from 20 gallons up to 120. I think some of the indirect manufacturers uh, make bu just plain buffer tanks with no coil in them. A lot of connections, you can get plain steel, you can get um, stainless steel, you can get composite ones now. Uh, the Boiler Buddy, I think is just a uh, plain steel, it's not even enameled steel inside. So you got a lot of choices for brands and sizes and also uh, uh, material types. So yeah, you're gonna see this one, but there's a couple better ways to do this in my opinion. And I've played around with these and I've been able to watch this over the years and see. And so this was another um, example that came to us. I think we first saw this from one of the Austrian uh, pellet boiler manufacturers. I think Siggy saw this at one of the um, the is shows years ago that they were showing this two pipe buffer. So we, you know, talked to those people, why would you do this or what's the advantage of this? Well, a couple of things is number one, a fairly easy tank to find. In fact, I could take an electric water heater and just unscrew the elements and get some adapters in there and make a two pipe buffer tank out of an off the shelf tank that you can buy anywhere in USA. So it's a readily accessible tank if you want to uh, customize and build your own. Um, also a lot of different sizes available there. Obviously electric water heaters from probably six gallons all the way up to uh, you know multi hundred gallon tanks are available for that. The key to this right here, this two pipe, and I'm gonna show it a little bit more on the next slide, is this section of piping right here has to be as short as possible and big, the bigger diameter, because this is an extension of your hydraulic separator. So this tank again is your hydraulic separation that you could have different size pumps coming and going on this piping here. And this wide spot in the road, this big diameter piping is an extension of that tank. So you need to make this what one rule of thumb is I'd like to have this size so that whatever the combination of the flows that can come and go from this tank, I'd like to have the flow velocity in this section of pipe down around one foot per second, certainly under two feet per second. So let's say, for example, I'm going to come in here with, um, I don't know, 10 gallons a minute. I could go online and, and just go to one of the pipe sizes and they're available everywhere and say, okay, with 10 gallons a minute and just start selecting different pipe size. And I think you'll find about inch and a quarter pipe with that kind of flow rate. This section of pipe would be down between that one and two feet per second. So uh, no harm in oversizing that. I mean, if you got two inch connections in a buffer tank, just take a two inch nipple there with some T's or bell reducers, however you want to make that and um, make a little hydraulic separator there, but as short, as close as you can get it as possible. So let me show why and how that works on this next picture. So in fact, let me start with the right tank first. So let's say I've got the, the boilers firing up at max uh, output and the pump is running at 10 gallons per minute. Maybe it's a variable speed, maybe it's a fixed pump, but let's say it's you know running at 10 gallons per minute. 
but I only have an eight gallon a minute load column on. Let's say my, all of my zones are in open or something. So what's gonna happen is here, is all the flow is gonna come into this tank and just like a primary secondary piping, eight gallons a minute is gonna continue on through the tank and two gallons a minute is gonna go down through the tank, unfortunately busting up my stratification. And it's gonna return to get the 10 gallons back to the boiler because whatever comes out of a pipe has to go back into a pipe. So if 10 gallons a minute's coming out of my boiler, somehow, somewhere, 10 gallons a minute has to go back to it. So I'm basically just sipping off the amount of load that I need. So anytime that I go across a tank with a four port tank, there's gonna be some interaction in that tank unless, and this is a pretty rare condition, I had exactly 10 gallons a minute coming into the tank, 10 gallons a minute going out to my load, then this water will go straight through the tank and it's not even seeing the buffer tank as a part of its piping. So the only time now the buffer comes into play is as this load starts to lessen or go away, uh, then a portion of the water coming from the boiler is gonna start to recover my tank, charge my tank up. When this load goes completely away, the boiler is gonna keep running until the aquastat that's, you know, let's say right here somewhere, uh, tells it it's up to temperature. Now I've got my buffer stored. Now what'll happen is, when my load calls on, if my tank is hot enough, it'll just pull from the tank like this and it won't uh, uh, get any interface from the boiler until the boiler's tripped on and that circulator starts and then that starts bringing it in. But look at the difference what happens over here with a two pipe. So I still got 10 gallons per minute coming from my boiler into my tank and I've got my eight gallon a minute load, but I'm not going across that tank. So I'm not busting up the stratification layer as much as when I move right across it on the top and bottom. So yeah, I still have that two gallon per minute load going down here or flow going down to the bottom, but I don't have to cross this tank every time I wanna to get to my load. So that's gonna do a few things for me. Number one, I'm gonna to get to my load quicker so if my boiler kicks on, this load from, or this output from the boiler immediately goes to my load for whatever GPM it requires, and I don't start recharging or charging my tank until that load is less than this load. So I might not interface with this tank at all during a design day. I might just go straight at 10 gallons a minute from my boiler, 10 gallons a minute to my loads connected to it, and the tank isn't even in play until the loads start, go start going away and the tank can start to uh, catch up and recover. So um, it makes it a little bit um, more user-friendly, certainly from the tank standpoint. Now that being said, <clears throat> um, yeah, this is just some more examples of that. So you can see here, um, 12 gallons a minute coming from the boiler, 12 gallons a load, nothing's happening here. There's no stirring, there's no mixing. My thermal client can stack up now from the last time this boiler shut off. Now I've got a nicely stratified tank for when this load goes away and the boiler shuts off. Then when the loads come on without needing the boiler to fire yet, I'm pulling out of this nicely stratified tank. And I'm gonna show you how to do that with outdoor reset too. And here's where you start to do the blending. Now those loads could be different. I could have only eight gallons a minute coming in from my uh, boiler and maybe an 80,000 BTU boiler run that 20 degree delta T. I could have a load that's bigger than that for some reason. And so you'll see how the thermal client is moving. See how the, the color of the water. And this is the one of the things I wanted to see by making a clear demo. Does this really happen in there? You know, does, it, does that thermal client actually move like the lines on the paper tell it or show us to move? And uh, I'll show you what I discovered when I did that. Uh, Dan, you got anything? Just so I can uh, take a break. Any questions or anybody want to add anything? Or if not, no, we haven't had a whole lot of questions coming in on you know live questions. I've been trying to look through the pre-submitted ones, um, but I think a lot of this you'll probably get to. Maybe come back to this a little later. Yeah, we can do it at the end. If if there's one that pertains to a slide, I'm on by all means, just uh, shout it out. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. So here's another concept that just came to us recently within the last couple of years and a Manning, John Manning is an engineer. I think he's in upstate New York somewhere. He does a lot of work in the geo industry, he does a lot of uh, seminars and training for the geo industry. And he came up with this idea. He said, well, what about a direct to load piping arrangement with three pipes instead of two or four pipes? And so what's happening here, if you look at the way the hot water is coming out of the board, the supply, I'm going directly to the load, which is good if the loads are the same. Obviously, I'm just going right through this, going right out to my load, eight gallons a minute here, eight gallons a minute there, no interaction with the tank. But when you start to look at heat pumps, it's really critical that you bring either the lowest or water, uh, um, lowest or highest temperature back to the heat pump, depending if you're heating or cooling mode. And the way you can do that is on your return, if you come straight across the bottom of the tank, 
this heat pump in this example here it could be a boiler is going to see the lowest operating temperature that we're showing here with that cold water coming back and we're not going to start blending the tank because i'm not going into the tank at all i'm not even going in with my two pipe connection there so this is really going to maximize it and what john did is he actually used a transist that's a Oh, it's a really powerful simulation software came out of the University of Wisconsin years ago. A lot of the renewable people like it. And he modeled this and he actually modeled it and then he ran a heat pump and he found that he could get about 10% increase in efficiency in this here uh, heat pump by going with this three pipe direct to load as opposed to the old four pipe that most of the, the geo guys and the the uh, chilled water people are still using the four pipe buffer. So again, it's just a subtle little difference between the two connections here, but it does make Again, in John's uh, simulation and experience about a 10%, which I would imagine it would do the same thing with a ModCon. Because again, if this was a ModCon boiler, I want the lowest possible temperature always returning back to that boiler to drive up that condensing, to drive up that efficiency if I'm running in those temperatures. So, and again, it's a, a little simpler piping there. Obviously, you'd still have to have a tank with these connections. These are fairly common too. A lot of the uh, domestic water uh, storage tanks have uh, connections like this where they have one on one side, one on the other. Usually they have a, a two close together here that they come from maybe a copper tube boiler to uh, use that as a storage. So this is a fairly um, common accessible tank if you want to try this uh, this three pipe direct to load. Sorry about that. Graphics is a little fuzzy. I just copy it and move it so many times. So. so here's an example of all of them. Now the other thing I want to show in all these is the expansion tank connection. Um, really it could be on any one of these connections but i like to see it on one of the two bottom connections here because again that'll see the coldest possible in a boiler that'll see the coldest possible temperature i don't know if that's a big deal as far as the longevity of the tank but uh it makes it easier to mount it if you're down here on the bottom with either a base mount or where you can mount it through the top so these are things if by the way if you go and search uh, john manning uh, he's got a really nice youtube video of one of the presentations i think he did it maybe for igspa one of the ground source uh, associations had a um, a seminar and he did this presentation and, and he goes in a little bit more of the uh, the math behind it that I'm going into here as far as how the transit system uh, simulated this and uh, shows the results so if you're interested in this uh, I google that and it'll it'll come up as a YouTube video. Bob if I could interrupt you just for a moment uh, we have a hand up uh, okay. so Luke, I am gonna unmute you uh, Mr. Luke Murphy and let's see if you can answer that ask that question. And he is self-muted, so I'm sorry about that, but Luke, we'll just have to wait then for another time or punch in your question in the panels. Um, yes, so two things like Mary said, if you want to ask the questions, we can unmute you, but if you're muted on your end, obviously you got to do that on your end. So two things have to happen for us to be able to uh, to talk to one another is you got to unmute yourself and then we can open your mic uh, on our end and talk to you. So try it again if you want. So what we want to know is what size buffer tank do I need and what kind of advantage is going to give me? Well, the formula is fairly simple for a BTU into a tank. It's just the basic uh, hydronic formula. But what we want to do now is put into the basic hydronic formulas, we want to put in some volume so we can get some um, estimates of what this tank can do. So here's one that you would use for just a regular on-off boiler. There's mo no modulation in this boiler, so we'll assume that when the boiler fires, we're getting a, a fixed output. So um, what I would want to know is the, the, the time. So you put the time in here. Let's say you want a 20-minute run cycle. You put that in there and just crunch the numbers, and it's going to tell you the volume. And we're going to do an example over here in a second. So basically, what you need to know, too, is the delta T that you can run that tank at. You know, if you've got a... Uh, uh, let's call it a high temperature boiler, maybe a wood boiler, a pellet boiler, even a cast iron boiler, that I could run that tank up to 180 degrees and pull it down to a low temperature, maybe for a, uh, a slab radiant of say, I don't know, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. Now I got a huge delta T that I can leverage in that tank. So I'm going to get a lot more drawdown. I'm going to get a, um, a better, you know, um, drawdown time out of that tank if I can leverage a wider delta T or wider temperature difference. It changes a little bit when you want to start doing a modulating boiler because I want to know what, what my modulation rate is. So here we're going to put in one more number, basically what the low turndown is on that modulation. So it's going to allow you to get a little bit tighter number and a little bit more use out of a smaller buffer tank because of the modulation can handle some of that load. So just let's take an example. So let's say I've got a, 
a 50,000 B2 input boiler, and it can turn down to, let's say, 10,000, a five to one turn down. And let's say I've got that small uh, panel radiator towel bar in my bathroom that I want to maintain in the shoulder season when I don't have any really heat load in the building, but I like my warm towels. So I'm running that little uh, towel bar, that little panel radiator. And let's say I want that boiler, even at its lowest turn down, to run at least 20 minutes when it fires up to, to cover that load. And um, let's say I can let that tank run at a 20 degree delta T. Maybe I've got my boiler running at 130 to uh, you know 110 to 130, pick a number there. It doesn't really matter the delta T doesn't matter if it's 180 to 160 or 140 to 120. So there's the formula right there. So we put the 20 minutes in there, we put the loads in there and the delta T formula there, that's for water and we come up with 17 gallons. So it's pretty easy to do. It would be a little bit bigger on this tank here where they don't have uh, the ability to leverage that low modulation. If this was a 50,000 fixed speed boiler over here, uh, this tank is gonna get bigger to, to be able to do that same 20 minute. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, these formulas, by the way, are in the Hydronic 17 if you want to just take these and crunch some numbers on your own. I know there's at least three people that have um, little free simulators on their website to do buffer tank sizing. I know uh, Boiler Buddy's got one on their website. Uh, Lock and Var's got one on their little toolkit online that you can do um, a buffer tank sizing. I don't know if they allow you to do the modulation as well as the, um, the one without the modulation in there, but uh, you know, if you like doing it longhand, there's the, uh, there's the math for you. What am I doing here for time, by the way? Oh, yeah, we're looking good. All right, so to, just to sum it up a little bit on this, the best, the hottest water directly to the load. We don't want to blend that water at the top of the tank if we can help. We would like to go from the tank directly to the load, from the boiler directly to the load when that's doable with the two-pipe system. Um, the separation, obviously, if we're using different size pumps, you know, the separation is sort of built into a buffer tank, so we want to be able to leverage that. And if you use a two-pipe, make sure that uh, that short, stubby connection in the tank is sized big enough so that the two pump flows, just like primary, secondary piping, that those flows can uh, get along together inside that section of tight, uh, pipe. And then this, you know, the sky could be the limit. I know I used to hang out on one of the uh, uh, the chat rooms that was dead. It was just wood-fired boiler guys that hung out there. It was, um, what was that called? Um, the woodshed or something like that. And those guys are, they're going crazy with these buffer tanks. They're putting two 500 gallon, like old LP tanks stacked together. They're, they're trying to get it so they can get through the night on hot water without having to get up and put a log in the fire so they can just get up in the morning. The tank is still putting heat in the building and start the, uh, the procedure over again of burning wood, which I'll tell you, it's a real uh, intensive job to, to heat with wood, especially when the, when you have a fixed speed boiler. So, that's an example where you see um, guys really going those huge size of uh, buffer capacities. And uh, I know Tarn Boiler up in uh, New Hampshire, I think it is, offers uh, unpressurized buffers up in like a 2,000 gallon range. So that's their goal there really is to get the low drawdown and also be able to, to run a, maybe even a day or two without having to you know load the wood in and fire up the boiler. Maybe they're going out of town or something like that. So again, they do that with water because unless you get into a phase cha uh, change material, it gets pretty pricey. Uh, water is still one of the best places to, to park energy. So, uh, you know, I was on that wood heat and said, well, I guess maybe I have to try uh, one of these supersized buffers. So I found an old 500 gallon LP tank on Craigslist and it took me like months to get the smell out of that thing. I don't know if you've ever worked with propane, but getting that metacarp or whatever that's called out of there is, isn't easy. Finally, OxyClean did it. But anyways, so I got the tank 10 feet tall, welded some legs on it, and I built these headers that went into it out of three inch pipe. And I think I got a picture coming up. I, this header actually goes into the tank. And like I say, I put slots at the bottom, slots at the top on the upper one to keep from busting up the stratification in that. And so here I was trying all the different uh, pumps I could get my hands on. So uh, there's the pumps down at the bottom. You can see different uh, ECM pumps. And uh, I don't know if you can see this. So what this tank does, it, it, it does multiple jobs for me. It's my buffer tank for my wood boiler. I've got a 130,000 B2 wood boiler, tiny load. I think my load at design in this building is like 30,000. So uh, grossly oversized on the boiler. But I also I have some solar thermal up on the roof. And so what I did is I leave a space at the top of this tank. I only fill this tank, and it's pressurized. I fill this tank up to that point right there. I've got a little sight glass built on the side of it so I can see when I've got that level. So now that, uh, I don't know, I've got about maybe 35 gallons of space up there that becomes my expansion tank. So as this 470 gallons of water heats up from whatever, you know, ambient temperature to 180 degrees, 
that becomes my expansion tank. So I don't need to have a separate expansion tank. It also becomes my drain back space. So when this pump right here starts, and that's this little first pump, this little ground Foss alpha, uh, starts up and it pumps cold water out of the bottom of the tank, out, 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 up to the collector, through the collector, and down to the bottom. When this pump shuts off, it has access to this air bubble to break the siphon, and this whole thing and all this piping up on my roof and up in my uh, rafters here drains back into my tank. So now I've got a thermal uh, storage tank for my wood boiler. I've got a expansion tank. I've got a drain down tank built into my buffer tank. In fact, today this tank's up to about probably 120 degrees from the sun because I've got no load on it and it keeps churning away. And then also I've got a little ModCon boiler here. And so what you don't want to do if you're going to use a wood storage tank, for example, and a uh, backup heat, I don't want to ever heat up the 500 gallons of my tank with my LP boiler. I want to wait till the, either the sun comes up or I can fire up my wood boiler. So what I did is I tied the return of the boiler up at the very top of this header right here. So I'm probably only heating Again, maybe 30 gallons of water that the boiler when I'm firing up on LP uh, ever heats up. So that's my uh, opportunity for the boiler to have a little bit of buffer also, but I don't have to heat up my tank. So then when the sun comes up, I've got a cold load to present to the sun or to the wood boiler. Bob, then, I have another question from um, an Anthony from the audience. So I'm going to try to unmute him. He's okay. got a comment to share. All right. Anthony, if you can, there you go. You are uh, You are live. Hey guys, how are you? Can you hear me okay? I can, how are you? Good, Bob. Hey, nice job. Good subject, too. Thanks. You, uh, you mentioned a few slides back that you don't have any set rules of thumb. But I've been using buffer tanks for a long time, and I'll just give you my rules of thumb. All right. You know, Europe, Europe does a lot of constant circulation. So if I got a condensing boiler and I got a single zone with closely spaced T's, constant circulation, I'm probably pretty good. If I got yep. two or three zones that are, you know, close together, well, then I, you know, I, I want to use one of your wonderful Kalefi hydraulic separators that work well, size right based on the GPMs, right? Okay. But if I have more than that, now I want to go to a buffer tank. Your average boiler will start 10 to 11,000 times a year. Your average condensing boiler could start 32,000 times a year. We size for the coldest day of the year, and we're trying to maintain 70. Right, but when you get to 50 degrees, your load is one fourth of what it is on design. Yeah. So if you got a if you got a if you got a 10,000 BTU zone at zero, you've got uh, a 2,500 BTU zone at 50. There's no boiler that can modulate down to 2,500, and one of the reasons why they can't is because the the fuel to air ratio mixture. It's just it's too finite at that point, and they just can't get it to stabilize. Yeah. So, buffer tank is is just a simple way to go. And I, I've seen boilers with fifty five thousand starts on them in four months. Four months, fifty five thousand starts, and mm -hmm. only like you know twenty eight hundred hours of runtime. Then I've seen jobs with buffer tanks with a hundred and 170 hours or uh, 170 hours of runtime and 70 cycles with a buffer tank. So, and I, I, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, and I'm going to tell you that. So I use this, I use the Kiss method. You know, keep it simple, stupid. It works real well for me because you get, you gotta, you gotta hit me in the head first to get my attention before you teach me a lesson. You know, just to wake me up. And uh, that being said, the four four buffer tank. Yeah, Richie McGrath. From Lakewood, New Jersey, he loves, you know, he loves your two-port buffer tank, and he does it well. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, listen, I, I get that, but, you know, this piping, sometimes we have a hard time getting our head around it. With a four-port, you know what, it's going to just be easy for guys to pipe, heat source on one side, load on the other. It just keeps it simple. It acts like a big hydraulic separator. So, you know, 50 to 60% mm -hmm. of the year, you're going to operate at that small micro zone. When we plug yep. in our numbers through the calculation, everybody wants to plug in the greatest load for the smallest B2 zone, but really you got to plug at 50 degree load in because that's when it's going to operate most of the time, right? And, and so, yeah, I, this is a great class, great job. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and I hope that helps. I hope what I've said helps. 
Yeah, I don't know how you keep all those numbers straight in your head. I wish I could do that. But you're right. I mean, I, what we're doing here is the guys that want to take it to the extreme, you know, that are trying to, especially the Germans and the Austrians, that's all they do is engineer their whole life from the day they're born to the day they die. So I swear they engineer. And so they're looking, how do I get the last BTU out of that? And that's where these other piping arrangements come. And actually, if you watch that YouTube video of uh, John Manning presenting this to the uh, the ground source people, they're, they're kind of not fighting them out, but they said, well, we've been using the four point. It seems to work fine. He said, well, it, they do, but here's the extra 10%. If you want to take it, if you don't, you know, do it the way you're doing. So it just depends on how far you, like everything, how far you want to take it and how maximized you want to do on your, uh, you know, your energy use or your usability. I mean, <clears throat> some of us kind of get carried away with that and others, you know, like I say, KISS. So, and I think, you know, I've got a lot of time here at home these days when we're not traveling. So I got time to think about this and tinker with it. So here's what I did on mine. I mean, Again, what I was trying to do is get the most amount into a sack of potatoes here as I can. And so I get my, my solar, I get my radiant, I pull off different temperatures here. I even make my domestic water with a flat plate heat exchanger. I've got a close approach on my flat plate heat exchanger that's right in here that I can take a shower at 103 or 105 degrees uh, with this tank all the way down to 110 degrees with a generously sized heat exchange. So, you know, I can store energy for a lot of different things if I've got a, it's a battery. Just think of it as a battery here. It's a water battery, so to speak. And as you can see, it lets you play with different pumps, different speeds. Some of these are variable speeds. Some of these are, uh, I got some uh, Delta T pumps. I got a little of everything. So, and here's it, you know, here's the basic hydronic formula. If I want to heat that 500 gallons up to a uh, temperature, you know, say from 60 degrees ambient temperature to 140, it's going to take that many BTU. So if I had a that size boiler, you know, that's what it would take to run an hour to recover that tank. So, you know, the numbers are there for you to crunch and, and use. So the next thing, if I, what am I doing here for time? Yeah, I think we can do it. If you're going to use a buffer tank and you have the ability to do it, you really want to pull your loads off of that on an outdoor reset control because I want to use, here's an example, let's say at my design day, I need 120 degree water. Maybe I've got panel radiators or whatever it might be. I've sized it so I can carry my load at 120 degrees and I'm going to start at, let's say, a warm weather shutdown of 60, 70 degrees, let's call it. So you can see how I can track with that uh, temperature, with the outdoor temperature here, and be able to use water out of that tank all the way down to this low temperature here. In fact, if you want to pick a number in the middle here, let's say uh, that um, if I charge this tank to 150 degrees, I can use that tank down to 88 degrees with the type of heat emitters I have. So that gives me a lot of uh, uh, use a bill, a lot more usability with the tank if I can pull it out at just the temperature I need. I'm only going to sip off the exact temperature that the load requires. I could take this a step further and even put an indoor reset control on it. So I'm taking my load, um, watching my load both on the inside and the outside and just really optimize it. Now, how much time and energy and money that you want to throw at it to do all this? Obviously, you need a control. You need some more sensors to be able to do that. But the people that are already uh, familiar with, let's say, Techmark controls. I mean, some of the boilers have this ability built into them now too. So it's just another step to maximize um, the usability of that tank. And sensors. So I started looking at this and the first thing I realized, and this is one of our uh, buffers that I cut open, had a, a weld leak down here and I cut it open uh, to see what was in there, number one. And I said, you know, what I'd like to do is make a t a temperature sensors at different levels. So I took a piece of two inch uh, a brass nipple here with a cap and I drew it drilled through the top and I put so I could put four sensors at different levels by just crimping pecs on here and then I put a, a brass plug in the bottom of the pecs and put some heat transfer compound and then I strapped my sensor onto an old fish tape by the way you can buy that for 24 bucks at one of the Home Depot stores and just cut it for whatever length you need so you got a way to get make sure that your sensor gets all the way down into the the bottom of these wells here and now I've got a really good idea what the uh, the thermal client is in my tank and if I wanted to shut things off and on at a certain level like maybe I fire my my boiler down here for my pellet boiler maybe I fire my uh, gas fired boiler off of this sensor up here at the higher point so it just uh, gave you different ways to see different temperature I kind of got that idea from a tank I saw in Europe years ago at one of the solar shows and they actually had a track down the side of the tank where you could slide sensors down to certain uh, places on the side of the tank and would kind of pinch them in there I said well you know, like to have the sensor in the tank if I could for a little bit better resolution. So that's what I came up with. And these are just some other ones that I made. Sometimes if you have a connection that you want to put multiple sensors, maybe to read temperature, maybe to trip something on and off. These are just different variations I made from off the shelf parts and just got some uh, brass tubing from a hobby supply that fits the size of these six millimeter sensors that come with a, a lot of controls and boilers now. So that might be helpful for somebody to 
to build their own sensor. Well, these are nice because they're Schedule 40 brass, so uh, they shouldn't wear out or get a pinhole in them for a long time when you make them out of a thick weld uh, tubing like that, as opposed to some of the really thin ones that are on the market now that can sometimes pinhole. And so the question, so this is one I had up in my house so recently. I took this apart as we took the house down. And this is just a little, I think that's a six gallon electric uh, water heater that I use for buffer. So I just use a couple nipples there to increase that one inch immediately to inch and a quarter. And so now when there's a, a call for heat, the boiler can go directly to the load, which is a manifold over here. And then we'll just start charging that tank as it needs. And six gallons made a big difference on the, on the loads that I had in that house where I had just a, uh, a small bathroom radiant zone with a little heated towel bar that um, you know sometimes we'd let it run into the into the summer months so that was a nice way to do it and these are different examples of things you can buy off the shelf if you do want to buy a tank that has a small hole and you want to increase it right away these swedge nipples you can buy you can buy these swedge nipples from like you can get them from one inch up to six inch on the other end you can get them brass you can get them in stainless you can get them plated a lot of different options for buying this. This actually comes out of a Munchkin boiler, believe it or not. If you buy a 199 Munchkin boiler, they turn that one inch header that's inside that boiler in the inch and a quarter that you see through the side of the case has actually been done with a, uh, a swage nipple like that and obviously bell reducers. And this is actually a fitting you can buy. It's three quarter male by inch and a quarter. So if you're gonna use a tank and you wanna use maybe this connection right here, take the drain uh, cock out of that and get it up to inch and a quarter, you can screw that in there. And it's just a quick, simple way to get a buffer tank uh, from an off the shelf tank. I even let the element in here, I put a 4,500 watt element in it. So if I ever run out of LP, I can just, I've got a 30 amp uh, circuit there. I can just plug this in and get about 15,000 BTUs of uh, energy out of that by just using uh, the resistance element in it. These are, again, I started pulling out old pictures, and these are some buffer tanks I did probably, I don't know, 15 years ago when Dan Foss used to have these own control panels. I was using the HTP uh, tanks there and just some of the different ways that I would make buffer tanks. This was a, another electric tank where I just took the element out, took a hole saw, drilled a hole through the uh, the cover where the covers the wire typically, and just put a, a adapter in there and made a, a buffer tank because I had a lot of micro zones on that. Even the cast iron boiler, I did a little buffer on. So, all right, I'm going to get down to we're going to show the demo. So, let me set you up for what you're going to see with this demo. So, I said, you know, and I want to make a clear demo that you can see what's going on with these flows as we vary the flows and we change the flows from a two pipe to a four pipe buffer. So, I went to a local plastic company and said, can you build me a clear plastic tank that I could? Uh, and yeah, they gave me a price for that and it was crazy expensive. And it's hard to get plastic people right now because they're all making face shields for the uh, COVID people that uh, are putting those shields up. So anyways, to make a long story long, I just went online and I bought a plastic aquarium. I think this is a four gallon plastic aquarium, bought some bulkhead fittings, drilled them through the sides, both sides of this tank, and then put some uh, adapters and went to, I think an inch and a half plastic that I made this and I made closely spaced tees on that and uh, over on the other side. So what I wanted to do was try first a two pipe buffer and run it and see what happens inside this tank. I could vary the flow rates. I got some of our quick setters over here that I could change the flow rates and I could just inject different colored dyes down here. I got a little piece plug with a syringe. I could squirt some dyes in there and see what happens. A couple things surprised me that I hadn't expected, which I'll just play that video here in a second and uh, you can see what you think and we'll come back and talk about it. So pump over here on the other side, that's for when I do a four pipe, I fire up this pump and these are Oh, this would be a boiler pump, you know, pumping out of the bottom through the boiler back into it. And this would be maybe a distribution pump working the, the opposite direction. So I think that's how I set it up. So there's uh, what it looks like when I'm doing a four pipe demo with it. So I can run the pump or pumps on this side and then run this pump. And you'll see how it changes the flow condition through the tank. And the thing that really surprised me, luck as luck would have it, this little aquarium tank actually had an air uh, bubbler and it came with a little air compressor that I hooked onto that and I can put a lot of air, bubble air into this tank as it's running and seeing what kind of air removal I could get from just the, the uh, float vent on the top of it. So I think, um, let me go to the next one. We're gonna come back to that. Oh, that's my tool tip. Let me do this one. So I talked about the, I think I showed you that already. Yeah, the sensor well, yeah. You can strap on the pipe and you get pretty accurate reading. It's nice if you can to get it into the um, the buffer tank. All right, we're here. We're going to do a giveaway. Aaron's going to donate a uh, classic hydronics um, book for the person to answer this correctly, the first person. What year was the beach ball? That's a good summer topic, good summer trivia question. Uh, what year the beach ball was invented? 
we'll let people crunch on that for a minute. And thanks to Aaron and the heating help for that. Um, let me see, where's my little, uh oh, Mary, I lost my little, uh, my little link to my uh, demo here. All right. Bob, can you, if you can go back to the slide where the demo was um, mm -hmm. embedded oh, in, yeah. and you can just mm -hmm. click that picture. Oh, thanks, Mary. See, that's the value. One more, I think. <laughs> yeah, one that's more. Not... That's it. So while oh, folks are crunching on the beach ball, maybe they can watch that very cool video. Correct. It says, let me enlarge this. This one? Mm -hmm. All right. Here we are. Welcome to my Franken hydronic demo. So my goal here today is to show the difference between a two, three, and four pipe buffer system. And I thought making this visual would help people see exactly what's going on in here. So I'm going to start and show what happens with a two pipe uh, connection to a buffer tank. So what I have here is let's call this the boiler pump. And I'm going to pump out of the bottom of the tank, out of the bottom of the header in this case, and back up to the upper one. Now the other pump, let's call that my distribution. I'm going to push into the bottom and I'm going to push hot water out to my distribution, which is assumed in the back of this here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some red dye when these pumps are running. I've got them set at both the exact same flow rate, right? as close as I can get it anyways, within a tenth of a gallon, I'm hoping. And what should happen is when I inject some red dye here, you should see that flow just going through these two headers and no or very little interaction with the tank. I don't want to see water going from the top to the bottom and the connections inside the tank. So let me start them up and we'll squirt some juice in there and see if it proves out like I think it should. So take a little Pete's plug right here, a syringe with some red food coloring. Okay, I've got that in there. Now I'm gonna start both these pumps. I'll start the boiler pump first. It should take that fluid, should appear up here. You might see a little push in there just from the force of the pump when it first it's on. Now I'm gonna start up my distribution pump and you'll see the color is just blending right in here. I had, like I say, a little squirt in there, but there's no movement from the top to the bottom of the tank and that's important. I don't wanna stir the tank. I want all the load and all the uh, output from the boiler going directly to boiler directly to the load no interference with the tank in there so i think that proves that out pretty well so next we're going to go over and we'll do a four port where we're going to actually flow across the tank and you'll see i'll put a different color in there and you can see the interaction with the tank when i put the um the four port connection together here so let's give that a try and see what happens the other thing while you're here before you go i want to show you too a thing that surprised me as i put this together and was trying different things is I put a little air pump in the bottom, this little aquarium pump, and I was impressed with how well this tank eliminates air. Even with the pumps running, when I get the other pump running, there's flow going right through that air that's coming up from the bottom of the tank on my little aquarium pump here. But the uh, you can see the float, the cluffy float air vent I made on the top there out of some clear plastic. It's looks like it's getting almost 100% of the air that's coming out of there. I don't see any of it appearing in my pumps as it runs. So that was a win for me, and that was a, a surprise. So let's go on to the four port. All right, so now what we're going to do is I've got this tank connected as a four port buffer. I've got two connections over there, two connections over here. I'm going to run my boiler pump again, the first pump over here. But this time, instead of running the distribution pump from the headers here, I'm going to run it from the other side of the tank. And so I'm going to squirt some blue dye in here this time. And what you should see is a blue dye going across the tank. And that's going to indicate when we use a four port buffer that we're really involved in the tank capacity. So let's get started here. Got a little bit of blue dye in my syringe here. It's just to offset the red that I had in the first. Put it on my hand. Now I'm going to start the first pump over here, blend it up a little bit. See my color coming from the bottom of the top header. Now let me turn the pump on on the other side and see what happens now differently than the two pipe. Immediately it squirts across and you can see it going across the secondary loop over there in the a minute here you'll see at the bottom it stirs up the tank and I've almost kicked on my air I don't know how well you can see it with the color in there but you can see the air coming up as the fluid is going across here the air is still coming up and you can see it coming through my separator over here as it's run and so it's an indication that our air separation even with flow across the tank is still uh, doing a pretty good job and that now you can see uh, the whole tank is blended blue which that may or may not be desirable we'll talk about that so there's the demo Two pipe, four pipe buffer, three pipe is similar. We can show that. Uh, but um, yeah, let me know what you think of all of this. Thanks.
Well, while you are getting that uh, presentation back up, if Aaron is on the line, we had a tough question. What year was the beach ball invented? Uh, we have a Ryan Hoger, director of training, who guessed 1938. Aaron, how does that sound to you? That sounds correct. Congratulations, Ryan. Ryan, we'll get you that book um, by Dan Hollihan. So congratulations. Yeah, thanks for playing the game. So. Yeah, so that's kind of, um, we're looking for time here. I think that's pretty close to what I had in mind. I mean, questions or anything or comments or uh, certainly I'm <clears throat> here to learn stuff too. I try and learn something new every day, but uh, if somebody else has some other experiences that they've had, but yeah, I think that, you know, that pretty clearly showed what happened with the color there when the when you use a tank in different ways. And I, I didn't put a three pipe together. I would have to drain it and do that, but I would expect a pretty similar uh, result as a two pipe, but you'd see it again coming across the bottom when we, uh, returned across the bottom of the tank. And that might be desirable if I'm trying to get that coldest possible return back to a uh, condensing boiler again to the chiller uh, or to a heat pump to keep the efficiency up. I want to go directly back to it with the temperature that makes it as efficient as possible. So I don't, let me see what else I had here for slides. Um, yeah, that's a little demo there. Then we talked about that. Oh, my tool tip for today. Got to do trivia, tool tip, and the presentation. So here's something that years ago I came across. Um, we probably everybody's seen them as you walk down sidewalks. You see uh, concrete stamps. I thought, well, if I'm going to do radiant work, I should put my name, especially the jobs that were done well. <laughs> Maybe some of them I shouldn't have put my name on. But uh, Craft Tool has these. You can buy them, and they'll put whatever you want on them. Basically, up to that many. Uh, uh, numbers or letters, whatever you want to put on there. So I this made, and then you can change the year. Every year they give you a little, uh, you just drop a new a number in there. And so I've been doing that. I've been stamping concrete over the years with this. And then one day I had to do uh, some manifold boxes on the side of a driveway. And I went and got some big irrigation jumbo boxes, they call them, had a plastic cover. So I took my torch and I heated this up, uh, this big bronze uh, stamp with my uh, torch and just melted it right down in the plastic and was able to put my uh, my name information on the top of the uh, uh, the manifold the plastic manifold box. So if you're proud of your work and you want to put your name on it forever, um, you can buy one of these craft stamps. All right, what else do I have for you? Okay, we did the beach ball. I like the way that bounces in there. I think. Um, yeah, we can keep talking about things over at heatinghelp.com. I think that's probably the best place for the industry to get together and chat if you want to uh, share things. Aaron does a good job of uh, keeping order over there, which we appreciate. Uh, things don't get carried away, and uh, a lot of people go there, both uh, professionals as well as homeowners that uh, have some good stories and information to share. So, uh, Dan, Mary, Bueller, Bueller, anybody got anything? Um well, we had a few questions I tried to answer as we went along. Um, one question was you know, about electric water heaters, that you mentioned electric water heaters, and um, how many of them have three-quarter or one-inch tappings? Yeah, and so what I found is about six gallons and up, you can get um, electric water heaters, but they only have one element hole on the smaller size. I think it, you have to get up to maybe a 20. It, it varies a little from brand to brand. About 20 gallons and up, you usually get two element holes, but you can use the drain hole. Again, you can only jam so much through a three-quarter hole, but you could probably take that up to oh, uh, you know, inch and a quarter, maybe get to uh, about 10 gallons a minute through that, and it seemed to work. Line. At some point, you know, you, you're building an orifice when you try and jam too many BTUs through a, a three-quarter inch hole. But um, I've also taken the, and used the top two connections, the two three-quarter, the hot and cold, take the dip tube out and just put a T across the top of those and turned it in an inch and a quarter. So I've got two, um, I'm using the two three-quarter holes on the top of the tank. So there's different ways you can do it, but you can uh, put a one-inch uh, threaded connection to an element hole. It's not officially an NPT you know, socket in there. It's a really thin uh, thread in there, but uh, a couple wraps of Teflon tape, and I've, I've never had a problem putting a, a nipple or an adapter, uh, some connection in the side of a, a an element connection on electric water heater, and certainly they're affordable and available everywhere. So uh, I've, uh, you know, I've used them all the way up to, I saw a couple in there, I think up to 50 gallon uh, electric water heaters for buffer tanks. But that was back in the day before we had a lot of people offer them. I mean, that was maybe 20 years ago on that one beastman that I did there. So we didn't have Boiler Buddy wasn't there. We weren't making Matt Cleffy, obviously. So you kind of had to do your own thing back there or else have a, a welder make one for you or something like that. So yeah, what else? Anything else, anybody? If not, we'll... Uh...
Well, Bob, this is really important. Um, it's kind of a trivia question for you, but Alan is wondering if you have anything in your house that is not homemade. <laughs> um, I guess my wife, she's standing here. <laughs> I can make it, I do. I guess I learned that from my dad. I mean, he built our swing set, everything that he could make out of pipe or weld or steel or something. He was an old uh, mechanic and worked at the steel plant for years and then had a plumbing company. So he covered a lot of trades and taught me a lot of those things. So, But I, I'll heat anything in my house that doesn't move. I'll heat the bed frame. I'll heat the, the concrete dog is now retired to the, the garden out front here, the towel bars or uh, the floors or the ceilings, the walls. But uh, yeah, I'll turn anything into a, a heating emitter if I can. Okay. And we've got one raised hand. I'm just double checking to make sure it's not the mute, mute, muted thing. But <laughs> so hold on here. Dan, did you have anything else on your yeah, side? Yeah, one, one more that came in. It says, I don't know if you have experience with HTP, but it says HTP has a buffer tank that has 45, 45 connections and they show the supply entering the bottom on the boiler side and the supply across the top of the system any idea why yeah i'd have to see that picture but you know that question comes up in fact it was on heating help again the other day with indirect tanks people say do you put the boiler in the top of the coil or the bottom of the coil you know it's going to work both ways i always thought you know if you put the hottest water in the bottom of the coil where the coldest water comes into it you'd have the best heat transfer but if you put the hot water in the top of the coil it's going to recover the tank quicker because it's going to start stratifying up so yeah i you know i've seen people cross pipe them too where they'll come in the top on one side and return on the bottom and you know actually i did a little research in fact when we were working on our chiller up there at Cleffy, uh Dan, that was before you were there. We we actually put a buffer tank. We had a 10-ton chiller on the roof, and it was short cycling. So we put one of our own buffer tanks in there. And when I started researching chilled water buffer tanks, they actually do that. They'll come in the bottom, and they'll go out the top with a two-pipe, just two connections. And some of them actually, uh, Wessel makes a, a chilled water buffer tank that has a steel baffle plate in it, so you use all the tank all the time so if that's the application that you're trying to maximize the use of that tank and you're just going to go in the bottom and out the top maybe that's how that tank was being used without knowing a little bit more about it it's it could be that they were trying to use it that way as a chilled water buffer tank and they wanted to use uh the tank by just uh you know rolling from the bottom to the top of it but if it was a four point i don't know again i i'd want to see that one to, to try and understand a little bit more about it right yeah, that kind of makes sense. Don't have any more questions. Um, oh, well, if on. I can sneak in, uh, Bob, John is wondering, okay, this is four, three, four, whatever, but can you just plug a four port tank to make a three port? Yeah, sure. Just cap. You can make it a, a, a. I go back to that slide. You can make a four port. Uh, really, anything you wanted. <clears throat> they sometimes tend to be a little more expensive tank. Anytime it's a, you know, not an off the shelf tank, you expect to, to pay a little bit more money for that. But um, in fact, when we sold a, a lot of buffer tanks to the geo industry, and those guys again, um, sometimes they just wanted to flow in and out of it, and they would. Uh, we actually sold stainless steel plugs that would go in our tank for people that didn't want to use them and wanted to plug it with a plug that. Uh, you know, was non-ferrous or whatever they, because it was a glass line tank. So uh, let me go back to this one here, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you could just, uh, the, the problem I have is if you buy a two pipe and you want to use a three pipe or something, then you're, you know, I have welded ports in the tanks before. I don't know that I'd recommend that for, for certainly for a customer that you field modify a tank, but um, uh, the four pipe. The one tank that's new out there, and I think it's through Flexcon, they've got a, a composite buffer tank, which I, I kind of like the idea of that as far as not, you know, corroding away and seeing how long it'll last. The only thing I didn't like about that tank, they've got their connections coming in kind of high and kind of low here. And when I talked to those people, they said, well, they need X amount of material above a hole in the side of a composite tank for, I don't know, stress cracking or fractures. So when I looked at that, it seems like you could strand a little bit of the usability of the tank by having those nipples down uh, maybe a foot from the top or bottom. That being said, you could go into that nipple and put a dip tube on that nipple so that you did get this, you know, the full tank usability, I guess is what I'm saying there. So, yeah, well, thanks for the uh, questions and the suggestions there. What else we got? Let me look at the list. Looks like we got people hanging on there. If there's anything else that we can, uh, if anybody wants to, chime in with a story or anything like that, um, now's the time. We had a great turnout tonight. Thanks everybody for taking time in the evening. I understand that this is your home time, but uh, 
it's a good time sometimes to sit and relax and uh got a plate of nacho sitting here next to me that i'm going to do next so anybody aaron anything else you want to wrap up here with i think that was all my slides let me go back and uh make sure i didn't miss any housekeeping slides here that's all i just want to thank everyone for attending and thank you to the team kalefi you did an amazing job this evening well thanks i think we're going to just um yeah, so that's what's coming next. Our coffee with Cluffy, John Sigenthaler will be on board again. This is a hot topic in the industry right now. We get tons of questions that we get. A lot of people show up when we do anything to do with heat pumps. So we're going to talk about uh, air to water heat pumps um, <clears throat> soon, July 23rd. So if you can tune in for that, it'll be archived if you can't make it at noon central time. And different places you can connect with us and all, also with uh, heating help. I'm sure you're on all the social media that Go to hold the Aaron of the folks at Heating Help. Um, that's it. We'll see you again July 27th. Same bad time, same bad station for our second episode of uh, Hot Topics. Anybody? Last chance? All right. Thanks, everybody. See you again. <laughs>